First up on stack is a brief history of OEA bargaining presented by our very own Craig Gordon. So this, this little history of bargaining in OEA is, is meant to kind of look at and kind of come to some idea about when we say when we fight, we win, what does that look like in, in real life? I'm gonna tell you the, the conclusion up front because so it's clear and um, that I think if we look at this history that major bargaining victories require full transparency and two-way communication all the way to a tentative agreement, no confidential bargaining anytime, including it, especially at the end, and leadership willing to escalate the fight sufficiently to win, including during a strike. And there's some reasons, maybe surprising reasons for that. Next slide, please. We'll take a look first, just that we're not gonna go for every single bargaining campaign, but I wanna look at the 1995-96 strike, which was 26 days. And one of the participants in that, who was very active, said at the end, we won on the picket line, but we drew at the bargaining table. And, you know, so pluses of that was we were solid organizing by members and community. We had 100, more than 100 um, house meetings leading up to it, uh, you know, galvanized strong support, clear focus on the demands, particularly for class size reduction and fair pay, 26 day strike which was solid pretty much all over the district for most of it and won a decent race but we did not get any contractually guaranteed class size reduction which is such a central demand we ended up giving up a concession that surprised everybody and demoralized people frankly at the end of counselor caseloads going from 325 to 500 to 1 and that confidential bargaining that led to that also embittered uh, folks so the lessons being from that strike and from other campaigns is that you need transparent bargaining, two-way communication all the way through, and you need to escalate because lost attendance revenue doesn't actually hurt the district. And I'll just touch on that why at the end. So decision-making transparency in OEA bargaining history has been, and, and when you get this presentation, which we'll send out, you can click here for a more detailed history. But pretty much across the board, Bargaining reports have been um, have happened during most of the bargaining campaign, but you've got confidential bargaining at the end and little or no input during bargaining. And then in the end, we've generally had no major improvements. Sometimes you get some little improvements, but nothing, you know, the, the ones that we're talking about, these transformative or significant improvements don't happen. We often have concessions or give backs with the district giving you a little sweetener to kind of like, you know, take the, take the sting out of it. And salary increases, increases sometimes of varying quality. Okay. So that's the norm. Again, top down membership input on the initial demands, compromises uh, at the end without people knowing. And there's a lot of CTA input to the top officers that transmitted to the bargaining team and then the members kind of are out there on the lines. So the last slide here, this is what we, we need to win. It's like, we need an engaged, empowered rank and file. They have to be engaged, but they also have to be empowered and so that you have this ability to give input throughout bargaining and be heard before significant compromises are made. So that you have to get the information that these compromises might be made. And then the members will let themselves be heard. You don't necessarily have to do a survey every single time you're doing a compromise, but if they know, they'll, they'll let make themselves be heard if they're organized and then transparent bargaining all the way to the end. And just last thing is, members develop their actions to increase the pressure for the demands. Um, because, you know, as last time we were talking about shutting down the port and having a, an old an old city march that would stop traffic. You need to do that because the main pressure on the district is not lost revenue from, from student attendance because that gets made up. The impact of the strike mostly is political, right? When you're shutting down schools that generates a lot of political pressure on the district not because they're losing the money so much but because of the political pressure from families the community and one thing we did last year at rep council uh before we had the april 29th strike we actually the rep council voted overwhelmingly to try to organize for what we call rolling strikes that's way people are on strike one day a week but every there's a strike somewhere in the district every day so that's about it, and you know, there's more uh, information about that if you click that link, and uh, you have to have leadership willing to, ready to do that kind of escalation. Thank you.